Now we're going to talk about Perkins and, and what is that exactly? Well, that's principally um, uh, walleye and yellow perch and this is the team that has assembled this particular update and I'm going to uh, lead off and speak mainly to the uh, 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 Michigan uh, side of the lake and then Chris Davis is going to uh, take over and uh, talk to uh, the status in the Ontario waters. So this map is specific to significant walleye populations in Lake Huron, but uh, probably this also reflects where a lot of the main yellow perch uh, populations and fisheries are as well. The exception might be in the southern main basin of uh, Ontario waters is a pretty significant yellow perch uh, fishery that's not uh, labeled there. I guess we have it a little easy in, in Michigan in that Saginaw Bay is really the primary source stock of walleye for much of the Michigan waters and it's also our largest yellow perch population. Chris has all these other ones that he has to try to summarize and sort out and, and talk about. This is uh, the yield ob uh, objective for walleye uh, across all of Lake Huron. So this is Michigan waters and Ontario waters combined. And this data goes way back into the, the 1800s. And that's principally commercial yield up uh, until the big plunge there that represented uh, a collapse in the mid uh, 1940s. And that's not unique to walleye. We see that sort of uh, graphic uh, shape across a lot of different species. And then a period of severe degradation that was owning primarily to uh, habitat degradation and water quality declines, and then resurgence in more recent times. The actual fish community objective says to reestablish or maintain walleye as a dominant cool water predator over its traditional range with populations capable of sustaining a harvest of 0.7 million kilograms. So that's that horizontal line as a reference point there. <clears throat> the modern period there in uh, recent decades is almost certainly underestimated in that Ontario doesn't typically maintain a, a creel survey to estimate recreational harvest. So the Ontario recreational harvest would be on top of that, but even then I don't think it is reaching up to that um, uh, fish community objective. Although on the, on the whole we'd have to say that this indicator is uh, stable. So I'm going to shift now and talk some specifically about Saginaw Bay as indicators for the Michigan waters. Um, we don't have formal fish community objectives on the Lake Huron level for Saginaw Bay, but tomorrow I'm going to be talking in another presentation that's specific to just Saginaw Bay if you're interested in that. And uh, we are developing uh, management objectives uh, for the recreational fishery at least. Uh, in Saginaw Bay, and I will detail that tomorrow. But here are some of the, the Saginaw Bay indicators that we think are important overall to Lake Huron. And that first graph there on the left is the yield. So this is not unlike that other graphic I just showed you, but now this is specific to Saginaw Bay. And that horizontal line now is a pre-collapse uh, average, and we can see where the uh, modern day yield is relative to that. So there's been a big resurgence of walleye, in Saginaw Bay, uh, but the uh, yield has not uh, reached that pre-collapse average. Although this is all a, a, a recreational fishery, and depending on what the exploitation rate may have been historically, if that were applied to this population, it may well uh, be able to achieve that uh, pre-collapse average. The graphic on the right there is the growth rate of walleye using age three as an indicator. And you can see how they used to grow much faster and now they are growing much slower. And this is really not about growth rates as much as it is about uh, density or abundance of walleye in Saginaw Bay in that um, when you have fewer, they're gonna grow faster, right? There's less competition amongst themselves for food and habitat. And then when you have more, they're gonna grow slower. So it's density dependent growth. And so we've used this as an important indicator with which to gauge when and where walleye are, are reaching our uh, sort of the carrying capacity, if you will, of the prey base and the adult habitat. And we really have predicated our, uh, our uh, opinions or, or targets of, of recovery uh, around this one particular indicator. And so we had a target value that was like 110% of the state average. That's what those, those are on the, on the y-axis. And so as density has uh, gone uh, 
up uh, growth rate has gone down and that's actually a sign that they are at capacity. This is the uh, mean trawl uh, catch rate of age zero walleyes in Saginaw Bay. And you can see how that really took off there in 2003. And we believe the, 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 the big surge in reproductive success traces back to the decline of alewives. It's long been known that alewives are a predator and competitor, a newly hatched perked fry, walleye and yellow perch. And released from that, they, they reproduce much better. So that's what's really fueled this recovery. Um, what's interesting is there, it looks like there's a, some periodicity to this sort of three stronger cohorts than a weaker one, three stronger than a weaker one. So we believe that this is actually a, a density mediated function of recruitment based off of um, uh, the stock recruitment function where when you have higher density after a certain number of years, then you're going to get a smaller year class in compensation. Although <clears throat> I will say that we don't think that year class strength is set at the age zero level anymore, rather that it's not until age two. There's a whole other talk behind that that we don't have time to get into today, but this is still a nice pattern of reproductive success that kind of illustrates that point. Uh, the graphic on the left here is our total walleye population estimate, age two and older, and this is a, a product of our statistical catch at age model. So currently it's uh, a little over 10 million age two and older walleyes in the population. The, uh, the next graphic over is the angler, average angler harvest rate in Saginaw Bay during the open water months. And you can see how that, how the fishery, the recreational fishery has responded to the increase in uh, walleye abundance. In fact, it's about a 400, over a 400% increase. Switching to yellow perch, this is the lake-wide yield of yellow perch um, in, spanning both uh, Michigan and Ontario waters. Uh, you can see uh, where the uh, fish community objective of half million kilograms uh, lies there with that horizontal line. Um, the, the, the collective fisheries were achieving that up until as recently as the late 1980s or early 1990s, uh, but in recent decades that has been well short of that. Uh, looking at the Saginaw Bay, uh, yield on the left x or left graphic there you can see how it is greatly depressed compared to where uh, it has been um, or what it's been capable of, of achieving well we think that the uh, principal reason for that is um, a high mortality rate between the age zero and the age one that's what this other graphic is on the right hand side um, so they are reproducing very well. That's the sort of the, the gray or the clear bar uh, that is uh, on, on the far right of the x, x axis in that those are the young of years. So they're reproducing fine, but they aren't uh, there when we go back to look for them as yearlings or, or older. Of course, that's uh, a bottleneck then to recruitment that is affecting uh, the fisheries and driving them uh, down. So uh, we believe that this uh, high mortality rate traces back to predation principally, obviously walleyes, other predators too, but principally walleyes. Um, so uh, I can elaborate all more on that tomorrow when I talk about Saginaw Bay, but I'm gonna turn things over to Chris next. Yes, uh, so in addition to the yield uh, information that uh, Dave was summarizing that was lake-wide, so that did uh, present the Ontario information as well, um, we're taking an opportunity this time, since this is a report out on the fish community objectives, uh, to explore something we hadn't kind of looked at before, which is uh, the other part of the, uh, the fish community objectives related to where the perkids, uh, the two uh, that we're primarily concerned with, walleye and yellow perch, where they fit in with their respective uh, species guilds. So basically their uh, ecosystem, potential ecosystem competitors. So the fish community objectives speak to that and I'll get to that specifically when I show that, remind people what the fish community objectives for perch and, and walleye are. I'm gonna talk about um, these as, uh, this is a, a program we established in 2014. It's called Broad Scale Monitoring. It's a small mesh gill netting survey uh, that employs eight panels that are, there's quite small nets. They're six feet high, 10 feet long panels, eight panels uh, going from one and a half to five inch stretch measure mesh. 
They're benthic sets. It's a netting that's done midsummer when temperatures are above 18 C. Uh, covers all depths uh, greater than about a meter. Um, we get catches. It catches fish basically bigger, anything bigger than about 50 millimeters in size. So it's a good fish community index. Uh, we collect all the biological sampling information, including we getting uh, preferred aging structures and gender from those fish. And uh, the map here that I've got up shows all the sampling that's been done since 2014. Uh, it wasn't designed specifically to, to as a contrast for this um, uh, fish community objective, but we're uh, applying it. It's largely in res response to our development of a walleye management plan for the lake, but it does have that broad fish community sampling and, and useful for this particular comparison. Uh, the, and I'll emphasize that the coverage, like I said, it wasn't really designed for this and it's not even among the basins. You can see Georgian Bay, in particular the eastern side of Georgian Bay and the North Channel have better coverage than the main basin, but we are expanding uh, the program as well. So I've got a couple of uh, my two slides here, basically one for perch and one for walleye. Uh, they're basically built the same way. The fish community objective is in the uh, top left there. And I'm going to emphasize the, the part, the, the first part of this, which is reestablish and or maintain walleye as the dominant cool water predator. So this the, the uh, expectation here is that there's only so much room for cool water predators in the system. Uh, they could potentially be competing with one another. Not that we're saying that this is necessarily a sign of competition at the levels we're at, but that's the assumption of the fish community objective is that there's, these are things that are, if you're trying to balance an ecosystem for preferred species like walleye and perch, that you would want them to be the dominant fish species in their guild. So we're looking at uh, then, uh, these are these two plots. One is the, uh, the one on the left is absolute uh, biomass and it's biomass per set in gram or in kilos. Uh, or sorry, that's a, like a, it's overall for the sets within that year. And this is the percent uh, composition uh, of those different guilds. So the one we're interested in here is uh, green walleye. These are the other cool water predators. And I did want to just, uh, for sake of inclusion, talk about all the other fish that are caught in the gear as well. So some things that you can see out of this, so this being, uh, so the way it's split up, it's Georgia Bay, the North Channel, Main Basin. The panels are set up the same way with Georgia Bay, North Channel, Main Basin. And you can see right off the top that there's more, more sampling and more fish caught in Georgian Bay than the North Channel and the Main Basin, respectively, sort of declining uh, as we went. Like I said, the, the effort wasn't absolutely exact, but the main one here that relates to the fish community objective is what proportions of these different species are caught. So we can see, uh, so the years, which you can't really see very well here, but basically the left uh, bars are the previous reporting periods, so 2014, 15, 16, and 17, and then 18 to 22 on the right. So we're just kind of looking the same as uh, was reported kind of in Scott's talk when we we're looking at reporting periods, is that the earlier part of the time series and the, the plot or the chart I've got on the top right here indicates the actual percentages. So basically the main take home messages from uh, the walleye analysis are that walleye are not currently the dominant cool water predator in any basin. The other, I guess I should list what the cool water predators that were considered in this are. Uh, it considered walleye, the two associates, Northern Pike and Muscalunge and hybrids of the, those two species and then smallmouth bass. And largely what this is, uh, response to, it varies by survey, but primarily this is because smallmouth bass dominate biomass in these nearshore surveys presently, primarily in, in Georgia Bay and the North Channel. Even in the main basin, there's a fair bit of smallmouth bass, and in some places that we've surveyed, we're seeing a few individual large pikes, so they make up a large percentage of the biomass. We pick biomass as kind of being representative of what's dominating the system. So when you look at the Kind of the two reporting periods, um, we've got the 2013 to 17 and 18 to 22. Uh, so for Georgian Bay, we've got, I probably should have my glasses, but uh, yeah, 16% versus 11% over the reporting period. So it actually declined a little bit there, but it increased a little bit in the North Channel in the main basin in terms of walleye as a percentage of the catch. And in those cases, it's sort of variable for, for walleye in that uh, over the reporting periods, it declined a little bit in Georgia Bay, but increased a little bit 
in the other two basins. So then just moving on to yellow perch, um, similar slides are set up the same way. So similar to walleye, the fish community objective here is maintaining yellow perch as the dominant nearshore omnivore. So this is uh, comparing perch to uh, the, the non-large bass centricids, so uh, rock bass, pumpkin seed, bluegill, two crappy species, uh, white perch and white bass, along with uh, uh, smaller catfish species, brown bullhead, yellow bullhead, mad toms and such. So those are basically the, considered the near shore omnivores that uh, we're comparing to perch. And you can see here, of course, uh, you know, this would have included the lower bars here, included things like we talked about in the last one, the cool water predators. And in this case, you can see that uh, yellow perch and near, other nearshore omnivores are very small percentages of the fish community by biomass. Numerically, they're quite abundant. Uh, when you look at the percentages, uh, we've got yellow perch uh, in a light orange and then beneath them, the other nearshore omnivores. So overall, yellow perch are not yet the dominant nearshore omnivores in any basin, uh, a little bit more so in the North Channel and, and uh, Main Basin in terms of nearshore omnivores as a percentage of total catch. But we're not seeing, we're also not seeing trends, upward trends, in fact, it declined uh, through the reporting period there. And that's kind of it.